Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. This week I have Corey Clark. Corey is a social psychologist who has widely published in the field, uh, mostly on moral philosophy, polarization, and some uh, political themes as well. In this episode, we talked about defining the social sciences, the challenges and problems with the current state of the social sciences. We also talk about the publication bias uh, along with research bias. We get into the unconscious and or implicit bias as it's known and discrimination. And therefore we talk about the implicit association test, the IAT. We also talk about what the replication crisis is at the moment in the social sciences. Um, some of the differences between the quantitative and qualitative studies and how they replicate or don't. We give some examples of this. We also talk about the value of meta-analyses in replication studies. And we also consider some of the pragmatic solutions for the replication crisis and improvement of academic research within the social sciences at large. We also discuss defining free will. Uh, this is a topic that Corey has written a lot about and done a lot of thinking on. And we look at that, the concept of free will and its juxtaposition of uh, moral retribution and or punishment. We look at some of the differences between the semantic, uh, semantics and arguments around free will. And then just as free will and how it correlates with uh, responsibility overall. This was a conversation I was greatly anticipating and looking forward to having uh, Corey's a wonderful person. She's super intelligent, super bright. And I had a lot of fun uh, talking to her. And we, I could have gone for probably another couple more hours, especially on the free will stuff that we tacked on there at the end. Um, so hopefully we can get her again. But for now, I hope you enjoy Corey Clark. I am here with Corey Clark. Corey, what's going on? Um, nothing. What's going on with you? <laughs> Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. Um, thank you for, for coming on. I really appreciate it. It's a big honor. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, okay. So people know you from your research. They know you, uh, probably from Twitter and online, but for those that don't know you, I, I would think so. I would think so. All the people that follow you, I hope they know a little bit about you a little bit. <laughs> um, Tell people that don't know you uh, a little bit about yourself, your, I guess, your, your um, academic background, your, your specialty, your research, what you're doing now, and kind of what you're doing in the future and as much as you want to share. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a social psychologist by training. I got my PhD from University of California, Irvine in 2014. Um, and I am now a visiting scholar at University of Pennsylvania. I consider myself a moral and political psychologist. Um, and I think that's mostly where my research, my research falls in those domains. But I study moral judgment, how and why we morally judge other people, and then political mm -hmm. bias. Um, so sort of how our political commitments shape how we evaluate information, what we come to believe about the world, and you know why we hate other people and can't get along with them and agree with them on anything. <laughs> can, you, can you explain for folks that, you know, there's probably not, I mean, maybe there is, but when I was getting my doctorate, and I, I didn't see a lot of moral and political kinds of psychology that was out there. Um, how did you, I could see social psych as probably being a, a good foundation or, um, you know, good groundwork for it. Um, but how did you kind of make, if there is a jump, the jump from kind of general social psych to kind of more very specific moral and political? Yeah, so my PhD advisor was Pete Ditto, and he is, I guess, more of a political psychologist than a moral psychologist, although certainly some of his work has ties to morality, as so much political psychology does. Mm -hmm. um, but it was probably through working with him that I started to get into it. I act, There was actually one point, I recall, my second or third year of grad school where he asked me, like, do you want to be my, like, political psychology person? And I was like, nope, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> um, because... 
I didn't really want to get involved in politics. Uh, mm-hmm. And I still actually try not to get involved in politics specifically. Like I really don't share my political opinions mm-hmm. publicly. Um, I try to focus entirely on the psychology of political thinking. Um, is that redundant or well, psychology? It, it sounds, it <laughs> the sounds psychology like... of political thinking. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're very the concerned. The psychology of politics. <laughs> yeah, you're concerned about neutrality, it sounds like. Yes, I am, I am. Um, the morality bit kind of happened when I started studying free will beliefs, and that was probably a, sort of against my advisor's will. He did, uh, look at that. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Um, but I, I, I think I was using this data set in one of my stats classes, and I started finding these really interesting patterns with free will beliefs and punishment and vengeance desires for vengeance and things so I started to get interested in that and then I kind of was like Pete we're doing this and he was like all right (laughs) (laughs) um and then I've 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 published quite a few papers now on what I call motivated free will beliefs um or just Mm -hmm. simply the idea that people perceive people as more responsible and in control of their behavior when they want to hold them morally responsible Mm -hmm. or at least that's what I think and that's what my work has shown yeah and yeah, I mean, you're uh, quite published. I mean, there, you have you have a lot of stuff out there in in scientific journals, and, and I think more in popular pieces as well. And you've you've written a lot. You've done a lot of research. You've written a lot that has to feel good, right? I mean, that's kind of what you I've do most work. of the time. Yeah, yeah, it has to feel good, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I I really enjoy it, so that helps. But I I like to tell for for maybe younger listeners who. Uh, feel as though they're they're perishing on the publisher perish side of things. I did not publish anything for my first six years of five years, maybe of grad school. Mm-hmm. Um, the first like three years, I was doing a lot of priming studies, like religious priming and money priming and mm-hmm. um, discuss priming and just like chasing effects around that weren't real, never published anything. And then I didn't really find my research interests until my fourth year mm-hmm. of grad school. So I was very slow to yeah, get for, the ball rolling. For those once that I don't got know, that's rolling. late. Yeah, that's a little yes, late. Usually that's bad. <laughs> second year, pretty much, you're kind of on your way. So fourth yeah, year is I a little was, bit late. I thought I was done for, but I've managed to make it work somehow. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, great. I've picked up the speed more yeah. recently. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell uh, listeners briefly, uh, you don't know this, but so I was on Twitter uh, and social media for a long time. And then I guess it's been like three, three years ago now, maybe, before, maybe more than that Four, um, I decided to just kind of like take a very long break from social media entirely. I just kind of was done with it all. And I got back on Twitter only. It's the only thing I have at the moment in, I guess it's two years, two years ago now. And I wanted it strictly just for like academics. Um, for my field in, in psychology and, and similar fields. And so that's really all I was planning on using it for. Um, I didn't tweet that much and I never really did before. And then I just wanted to follow people sharing uh, scientific articles and journals. I mean, I'm just using it for all of the nerdy reasons. Right? <laughs> that's all I wanted it for. And so I follow like a, you know, some of the, the researchers and academics and then Somewhere in there, um, I think I saw, like, I don't know, I somehow I came across one of the tweets you put out. Um, and for those of you who don't know, most of your tweets are usually about some, some kind of uh, paper that's been published, typically. Mm-hmm. That's typically your, your part of Twitter world, <laughs> which is cool. <laughs> I like it. And so I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. And then I, I think I hit follow. And then I just saw that often. I was like, oh, this is a nice account to follow. This this person knows what they're talking about, doing some cool stuff. <laughs> and, <of> it. <laughs> and then at some point, somewhere probably in the comments or something, that's where I saw uh, Bo and Ben Weingard, the infamous monozygotic twins, who both <laughs> have been on here earlier um, on the podcast. And so you were my gateway to the Weingard. So congrats. Nice. Um, yeah. So You're that's welcome. kind of the, yeah, that's the, that's the backstory there. But I, I started with you first, just, just for the record to show. That's probably rare. Usually people <laughs> probably go the other way. They're like, eh, I guess we'll follow Corey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're more active, I think. So they're, they uh, they're, they're more, active. more active. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, yeah, I try okay. to keep it keep it all business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, that's good though. Possible. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, okay, so let's. There's a few things that I have. Um, trying to figure out the best starting point here. Uh, we can go in a variety of directions, but let's talk about the social sciences at the moment. So current state of the social sciences. So maybe we can kind of broadly define that and then we can, um, if it's important, do somewhat of a, a re, very mini review of you know stats and research, whatever, to, if, it, if it's important. But social sciences, I include, and you tell me what you think about this, clinical psychology and all of the derivatives of psychology. So that would be social psychology. Mm -hmm. Um, I would put sociology in there. Um, mm -hmm. And you can expand this probably to arts and humanities a little bit. Um, how do you usually see mm -hmm. the social sciences, maybe as opposed to the physical sciences, but how do you kind of define it? I personally just define the social sciences as science that has to do with humans, basically, mm -hmm. um, which is complicated because you could put like, certain kinds of then you could classify like certain kinds of medical things as social science mm -hmm. and I wouldn't do that I would say it's like social behavior like human behavior mm -hmm. um so like sociology I think can be a social science but probably sometimes it's not and then mm -hmm. like same thing like philosophy sometimes is a social science and sometimes it's not right. um particularly when things are sort of normative and it's more like this, this is a good, like political science, like this is a good idea, <laughs> mm -hmm, <laughs> rather mm -hmm. than this is what is. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would, I would define social science as really any area that's trying to explain or describe human social behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I would agree with that either on the individual level, such as certain fields of psychology or probably social psychology, which is probably looking at groups of uh, people and their behaviors. So yeah, I still like, I'm not even entirely clear on the boundaries of social psychology. Mm -hmm. And that's like my area of expertise. Like, look, <laughs> I kind of think everything counts as social <laughs> psychology. Yeah. Uh, because it, it really does, it touches on like almost every sort of every kind of topic you can touch on. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't really know what distinguishes social psychology from from other sub disciplines of psychology. But yeah, I know that there's I mean, certain people will have certain opinions or strong opinions about where the lines are met and, you know, drawn. And I also am the same. I think that there's a lot of overlap. I don't, I think that's kind of a, not a really important distinction necessarily, but yeah. Um, and so, so let's just say, we'll say with, you know, clinical psych, social psych, um, and other aspects of psychology, um, in terms of the research end of it, currently there has been, um, some challenges in the, <laughs> I would say, the, it's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> the uh, of maintaining, um, I think some objectivity and neutrality mm -hmm. within the scientific method, um, mm -hmm. uh, mostly because of some ideological um, interference in some ways, not always, but. And so for you, how do you, I mean, you're, I mean, I don't do research um, as much as I would like to, you know, really not, not at all at the moment. And I, I haven't in a little bit, but you do that more, obviously. And that's most of what you do. And from your lens, how do you see the state of the social sciences in terms of um, some of the challenges, some of the problems, you know, what's the, what's the, give me the diagnosis here. What, what's the issue here? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I talk about the uh, sort of political side of it more than anything else, but I'm not sure that that's actually the biggest problem. I think that's one problem. I think probably the biggest problem is just how easy it is for social scientists to construct findings that they want to find, to frame findings the way they want to frame them. You know, like you can't study humans um, in a vacuum. Therefore, you have to not not always, but most of the time, um, you're investigating a sort of messy relationship, and you have to apply a sort of narrative to that relationship. So even if you discover a replica replicable pattern, and we can talk about the replication crisis, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but even if you discover a replicable pattern, um, 
the explanation you provide could be wrong and mm. there are incentives for supporting certain kinds of explanations so it's it's ideological in some sense because the social sciences are overwhelmingly liberal and so any kind of finding that feeds into the preferences of what liberals would want to believe is true about the world mm -hmm. um not only would scholars want those things anyway because they're liberals themselves but they know that's what other scholars want and mm -hmm. these kinds of conversations are happening behind closed doors all the time we have conversations with scholars oh people are going to love this or the reviewers are going to love this because it supports this narrative and that's really yeah. popular right now yeah. or you know this is going to be impossible to publish because you know it found the wrong thing so is it even worth pursuing mm -hmm. i've i've heard these conversations countless times so so you have people per, people pursuing their own interests, their own political interests, but then people pursuing their own personal interests. I want to publish papers. Mm -hmm. Also, I don't want to be like ostracized from the field for publishing certain kinds of findings. Mm -hmm. um, and then you combine that with seemingly endless researcher degrees of freedom. You know, there are certain things that are that used to be tolerated that aren't anymore. Mm -hmm. um, there's some things that I think were never tolerated, but for example, I know that there were scholars in the past who would run a hundred subjects, analyze their results, didn't quite get what they were looking for, run 20 more, analyze again, not quite there, run 20 more, analyze again. Okay. So that's, mm -hmm. that's something that I think everyone now accepts. That's not okay. That's mm -hmm. not to say people don't still do it, but right. we all know we shouldn't do it. Right. Um, but then there are things that are still completely accepted and they're just sort of part of the process, which is scholars choose all of their own procedures and methods and materials that they're going to present participants with. And of course, because they want to find, they want to confirm their hypothesis, because that's how you publish your paper, they're going to select the materials and methods and procedures that are going to, that, that they personally feel is going to be most likely to confirm their hypothesis. Um, and that's just one example of uh, of something scholars can do. So basically because studying humans is so messy um, and there's almost never one right way to test any empirical question. It's never like, I wonder if X, and then I know for sure how I should go about testing that. That's right. almost never true. Right. Um, and then there, there are always ways to justify why you found a pattern that you didn't expect or why things didn't turn out the way you thought they would. So, so I think it's just the social sciences are just so, so, so messy that it gives researchers way too much freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and then couple that with the fact that researchers are humans. They have desires. They have desires to be successful, desires to publish, desires to be liked, desires to help their their political uh, or su support their political goals. So um, it just, I think that's essentially the, the big problem with the social sciences is that you you have human scientists studying themselves mm -hmm. and with, with a lot of freedom. Um, and so- yeah, the, the the entire credibility of the field has been called into question, <laughs> in, in especially over the past decade. But so um, it it sounds like there's a there's a few issues here. The first thing is, or not first thing, but one thing is the well, one is the bias of both politically and um, you know, not even politically, but like for example, I mean, it's. There was a, a big paper a couple of years ago about how, and I think there's still evidence that, you know, in the social sciences, you know, 90% of them are liberals, right? Or, mm -hmm. you know, and, and or professors at many major schools that there, there's a heavy liberal bias. And you could use that in a small L or a big L, you know, kind of way. Um, and that there's less for uh, more conservative types of researchers and or uh, academics. And so not necessarily, I don't know if that's, I don't know if you can say that that's intentional, right? That that happened intentionally, maybe it did, but over time, that's where we're at, right? That's where we're yeah. at. And so now <clears throat> if somebody has, it, it kind of becomes like a big group thing, right? It's one of these things where like everybody in my um, cohort or, you know, my colleagues or people that are doing in a research lab, if everybody is 
more or less on the same end of the spectrum on things, and then two or three people aren't, it's less likely that their uh, proposals are going to be heard and or when they submit certain uh, scientific papers that they're trying to do, less likely they get published or even reviewed. It right. is one issue. And then I guess the second issue is how much of that is, so there's a bias in some ways in terms of the people doing research. But then the second thing is, is that um, I guess administratively, right? You know, so it's not just researchers, right? And maybe there's a kind of a, a blending here, but then people that are on certain teaching hospital faculty or people that are at certain uh, universities or, you know, ad uh, administration, they're also having a certain bias. Hey, here are the things that are quite, um, I don't want to say popular, but here's the things that are trending. Okay, we'll put out a lot of stuff on that. And if there's anything that is going to, if you could take good, hard uh, research um, in terms of it's very scientifically sound, it's empirically, you know, it's, it's uh, valid and reliable. Yeah, but, you know, that's going to be somewhat antithetical to the messaging we're putting out with all the other research that we're putting out. And so it's, you know, less likely that that stuff is being heard. And so there's less um, a diversity of, I guess, <laughs> research or academic uh, materials put out, and it becomes sort of like this echo chamber within social sciences. Did I kind of capture what you were saying? Or? Yeah, I mean, are you so people have tried to study how you know, whether there is political bias in the field. And I should say a lot of people are skeptical. I mean, most people, almost everyone admits that the social sciences are overwhelmingly liberal. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know what percentage would admit that that probably causes some problems. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would say, I mean, some people do say like, no scientists are scientists, you know, they wear their science scientist cap, and they're able to sort of overcome their other like human motivations. Um, in order to find the truth, they have the scientific method, and that allows them to find the truth. So not everyone would agree with me on this. But, um, but they, they have done studies looking at this and uh, like, um, Yoel and Barr, and I think this one is with Lammers, maybe. Um, like simply asking social psychologists if they would discriminate against conservatives and like um, hiring and like recommending grants and the, the means for these aren't high, but a lot of people admit that yes, they would to some extent. Mm -hmm. And I've even gotten into conversations with, with colleagues about this, where I'll mention the fact that people will discriminate against conservative findings and conservative scholars and they'll push back against me and be like, well, that's good. We should be discriminating against them. They're, they're anti-scientific. And I'm like, well, surely some conservatives are anti-scientific and some liberals probably are too. And right. yeah, we don't need those people doing science, but not all conservatives are. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't be using that one piece of information in order to determine whether someone is capable of being a good scientist or not. In fact, I think it is probably mostly irrelevant to their qualifications to be a decent scientist. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so people will admit that they'll, they'll discriminate against this, against conservative scholars or conservative ideas. And I think conservative scholars are, they tend to be at like lower, um, uh, lower ranked schools on average as well, which suggests that possibly they, they tend to get placed below their level of ability in terms of their, their ability to produce scholarship. Mm -hmm. Um, um, so, yeah, I, I mean, if the question is, what is it intentional, that's, that's hard to say, because it's not like it was a, a one person making one decision, it was right. thousands of people making tens of thousands of decisions mm -hmm. over the uh, 30, 40 years. Um, and now here we are today. So, um it may be hard to kind of pinpoint if there is intention or not. I mean, right, there's, there's too many variables there to consider. I, um, I guess the thing about it is, is that the fact, the fact that that is the case now that we know mm -hmm. that there is, a, you know, it doesn't seem to me, my reading of it, that there is anything that is trying to um, diversify or to have more difference in views like, hey, there's a 
there's a pretty strong bias here. We got some sort of an echo chamber here in terms of our ways of viewing the world. I mean, there's different, definitely in some ways, I'm not making a, a value judgment here, but there's a difference in seeing uh, the world uh, from a conservative or liberal lens, right? I, I don't say mm -hmm. that absolutely, but you know, more or less. And if there's one way of viewing the world or the types of studies you're trying to do or the certain um, uh, hypotheses you're trying to test, you know, there might be, there's definitely going to be some difference. Um, and in that way, it just seems like there isn't uh, enough that's being done to try and make sure there's not too much of a, uh, uh, a mismatch. Yeah, I don't think many people care. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> because because mm -hmm. I, th I think, I don't know the exact number in social psychology, but I think it's it's in the low 90s, 92, 93% and there are Democrats mm -hmm. um, in the United States, of course. Um, and no, I, I think very few of them care. I think probably they're pretty happy about that mm -hmm. because it's easier to operate in an environment where where more or less everyone already agrees with you. They already think the same issues are important. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to kind of support the same, the same values that you have. So I, I don't see why a reasonable social scientist would want to diversify the field. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's weird to want to diversify the field. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm weird in that way. And that's why like people say that I'm like one of the most right wing social psychologists, <laughs> even though I I, again, I don't try to reveal my political views, but I've never voted for a Republican candidate, let's say that. Sure, right. But I am like an extreme right wing social psychologist only because I think, hey, it would be good to have people around who have different uh, different values and different views of the world and um, to push back against uh, you need to have some people pushing back against whatever the mainstream agenda is, I think. Um, and then there are people like, for example, I, I believe, uh, so Lee Jessam's the department chair at Rutgers. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. he said he might have successfully convinced his department that one variety of diversity we should care about is viewpoint diversity. Mm. But most universities that care about diversity and almost all of them do, that is not the kind they care about. Mm -hmm, in fact, mm -hmm. that kind they don't care about at all. And, and even saying that you care about it might be to them perceived as violating their goals for diversity um, mm. because they have this misconception that all conservatives like are, you know, one kind of person that they hate and think is morally um, reprehensible. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Not all liberals think that and not right. all social scientists think that, but right, right, um, right. I think there, that's a, that's a fear that that exists among social scientists, among a lot of them. Yeah, and and I think that that's what makes, in some ways, this is maybe we can get to it at some point. But there's a certain kind of thing of it, it's important to have a certain way of saying, "Hey, look, if we are having an overwhelming bias in terms of." Um, the you know 90% or 93% or liberal how does it make it how does it make it i don't say easy but for people that maybe aren't to say hey well here's a study that came out here's some of the data and everyone that wrote this or everyone that's it, you know all the peer reviewers and everybody they're all you know in a different spectrum than i'm at you know that makes it hard to for some people to trust the science Mm -hmm. Right, because there's a there's there's an old look. We all have biases, right? That's in, that's that's that happens. But it's one of those things where it's like, yeah. But if you're not, if you don't, if you aren't tabling it, or that's a question, you know, are you are you not tabling bias? And then if you have no incentive to, because everyone else thinks the same way, mm -hmm. how does that make it then for um, people reading mm -hmm. certain journals to say this has some sense or some semblance? of objectivity. I think that's, mm -hmm. to me, that's the, the hardest part about that, right? Is, mm -hmm. hmm, I'm not saying it has to be 50-50 or some arbitrary number. Or I'm not saying that. But I think it shouldn't be 90-10 in, um, you know, at least major pieces of how we understand human behavior, at least in the United States or maybe internationally. I think that that's, we should try and have viewpoint diversity, at least 
you know, have those conversations or try for that. Um, so I don't, I don't know how you feel about it. But. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's um, a concern of mine. So one thing you see more and more is conservatives are more skeptical of science. And in fact, mm -hmm, they're more mm -hmm. skeptical of higher education in general. Right. Um, and if you're an advocate for science, for scientific literacy, for people, you know, getting a bachelor's degree, um, you would, I think, want to be welcoming and appeal to as many people as possible. Yeah. Um, but when your discipline is so extremely tilted, it's really hard for the opposing group yeah. to trust that group. So I've tried to run this thought experiment with some of my, um, you know, extremely liberal professor friends. Like if 95% of the professors at your kid's university were politically conservative, right? would you worry about that? And they're like, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, exactly, exactly. So if we have 95% Democrat, like 95% of all of the professors that your kid is go or that anyone's kid is going to have in college are going to be Democrats. A large chunk of the country, these are Republican parents and they have right. to send their kids to college right, right. and they're often paying to send their kids to college. <laughs> and so like, I find their skepticism toward the social sciences and toward higher education to be pretty reasonable. Now, not all of it is reasonable. Um, and I think, I think, it would be helpful if people could try to separate sort of like the scientific method and what science is capable of from mm -hmm. like, do we have problems in this particular area and why might right. we have those problems? Um, so I'm not saying like all of scientific skepticism is warranted. A lot of it isn't, but a lot of it is. And scientists mm -hmm. often look at that and think, oh, it's conservatives. They're anti-science. And it's like, well, right. are they anti-science because they're anti-science? Are they anti-science because science is now so tilted, no reasonable person would ever trust mm -hmm. that group of people. And you wouldn't either if the scales were tipped. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I consider that to be a big problem. And I don't see it getting any better, which means that you're probably only going to see a larger and larger divide on these these issues and mm -hmm. i don't unfortunately have any brilliant ideas for how, mm -hmm. to, how to make <laughs> <Right>. it better <laughs> i i'm <clears throat> we could maybe use um just because i kind of want to drill it down but i don't want to be redundant either but maybe we could use an example of something in the social sciences <laughs> Um, can you think of an example um, where this occurs, where there is, well, sort of a kind of group think, or, you know, there's an overwhelming bias, or this is all being put out. And then if there's something where there is good data behind it, but it is contrary to what many of them are saying, or, you know, all the rest, what's the, what's an example, I guess, to mm -hmm. kind of make it more tangible, if you can think of one. Yeah, an example that I often point to is the literature on unconscious bias and discrimination. So mm -hmm. I assume most people will be familiar with the idea of unconscious bias or implicit bias. It's often called in social psychology. Um, but this was this, in fact, this might be the single like biggest output of social psychology ever. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I wish I had the numbers, but thousands of papers have been published on unconscious biases. Um, and there was an assumption that it's important and it's related to prejudicial behavior. Pe people aren't aware that they're prejudiced, but they hold these like unconscious negative attitudes toward particular groups and that causes them to treat them unfairly. Mm -hmm. um, and and this became this huge concept. It, it has received so much media attention. I remember yeah. Hillary Clinton mentioned it in one of her elect, uh, her campaign speeches. Um, and millions or probably billions of dollars have been poured into this idea. Um, unconscious bias trainings, you know, at Google and Facebook yeah. and Starbucks. <laughs> like so <laughs> right. much money and right. so much time has been spent on this idea. And we really haven't 
learned much, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um, Calvin Lai, one of the people who is like uh, heavily involved in that research and Patrick Forsher and some others published a meta-analysis maybe a year or so ago, um, looking at the relationship between unconscious bias and discrimination and does changing unconscious bias change discriminatory behavior? And they found almost no relationship between (laughs) unconscious bias and discriminatory behavior and no evidence that changing unconscious bias changes discriminatory behavior. Now, that's not to say that there isn't some domain where unconscious bias does actually matter and it would predict discriminatory behavior and that you could change it somehow and help Mm -hmm. get rid of that discriminatory behavior. But we don't know that Mm -hmm. (laughs) after millions or billions of dollars have been spent and tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of hours poured into this concept by countless scholars yeah. for decades, and right. that's what we have to show for it? Mm-hmm. Okay, how is that humanly possible? Okay, the only way I can see that it could be humanly possible is that people were just highly credulous toward that idea. Mm-hmm. They wanted it to be true. Everybody wanted it to be true. Mm-hmm. Nobody questioned it until it was way too late. And we allowed these ideas to bounce around <laughs> unchecked. Um, for a really long time and now here we are and now we're re retesting everything doubting everything that we thought we knew for sure um and and like i just think the only way something like that could happen would ha- have to be if you had a group of people who all had the same desire for that to be true mm-hmm. other things tend to get corrected quicker Mm-hmm. Um, although maybe that's not true like a lot of people still believe a lot of freud's crazy ideas so <laughs> those are sexy in their own way right <laughs> i have i have a i have a may, maybe i'll have it with uh with Bo. i'm not sure but i have a a date at some point where him and i or maybe someone else i'm gonna have on here and we'll We'll kind of battle out some of Freud's ideas. Oh, are you a Freud I, fan? I, I'm sympathetic to Freud. <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> but but I'll say this. I'll say this. Um, you know, I would say more in a contemporary modern sense and not in like, you know, an old school drive psychoanalysis sense. I think, you know, some people still do that and that's a very niche thing and that's fine. Um, but I think for the the form of using psychotherapy as psychodynamic and which is more relational based interpersonal based has you know good scientific support which has its roots in freudian theory but people debate that i don't know a lot about like (laughs) therapies and what Mm -hmm. what works and what doesn't completely (laughs) all i know is that the edible complex doesn't make a lot of sense (laughs) yes it just doesn't make a lot of sense yeah there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of um it's it's hard to kind of I think parse out some of the origins of the theory and then kind of where the science is on um you know how it's been supported and you know for like interpersonal um which is kind of a mix of that you know is just as efficacious as um you know CBT and all mm-hmm. those other uh, analogous uh, therapies so um yeah so I mean the unconscious uh bias stuff yeah I mean it's I mean I'm sure plenty of people have heard about it now um, which I th- feel like maybe I'm wrong. You, you tell me, but there was, I think on a method sec, uh, aspect of it, you know, the implicit association test was probably one of the, the big pieces. Um, so I, one, one of my last rotations, um, when I was doing, getting my doctorate and everything was, you know, I, I had a kind of a sub specialization, just, you know, not enough to be specialized, obviously, but I did a lot of neuropsych stuff. Mm-hmm. And I can remember one of my rotations, we used to give out the implicit association test. And I remember, I mean, this was, oh, goodness, I'm old, like eight years ago now, seven years ago now. Um, and, you know, I remember it was like a, I remember my, my, my supervisor at the time who was a, you know, board certified neuropsychologist was like, Hey, this is sort of a newer test. You know, it's not, you know, a gold standard, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, 
you know, but every now and then we would, you know, we, Iowa gambling task, you know, implicit association task, you know, there's different ways of trying to get at certain, um, you know, subjective experiences or certain, you know, phenomenological uh, qualitative data from, from patients um, that had a myriad of issues. Okay. So it was not like a staple of this is like the main measure we're giving, you know, we're giving mm -hmm. Wilcock Johnson, you're giving a waste, you're giving a, you know, all, you know, exact Dells Kaplan, you're giving all the like main um, measures that are used for cognitive functioning, personality functioning. So it was kind of like an answer, ancillary kind of measure that we would give to, you know, see what data we would give. And I can remember, you know, we both looked at the norms and we looked at some of the stats on it. It was like, eh, we need to do more work on this. And it was like, we didn't really think twice about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And we never, you know, sometimes we didn't incorporate heavily all the data that would come from it. It, just, it was a, you know, you kind of give tests like that to just kind of throw things at it and see what, see what comes up, you know, on the, on the data set. Okay. And all of a sudden, you know, people were using this test mm -hmm. <laughs> to try and understand people's unconscious biases. And I can remember hearing, I'm like, you know, I remember when Hillary Clinton brought up and I was just like, unconscious bias. I was like, oh, I mean, that test that, that like, you know, that was like, oh, that's like, you know, so then I looked into it a little bit more because then people were getting really like, you know, animated about this. And then I, I know that at various points, I think publicly and then, well, well, in um, some journals and then I think in more other informal ways, one or two of the creators have been like, yeah, this has very um, unreliable stats to it. Like we, we're, we were not intending for it to just go this far where now like there's compliance trainings at businesses to be, you know, using some version of this or some form of this or using that as, you know, to, 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 you know, mark this as unconscious bias. And it kind of took a life of its own. So I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the IAT as it's known, mm -hmm. you know, and how does, I don't know if there's other measures that have been um, created. I mean, there must be after that, um, but it, I don't know if you have creators of a test saying, Hmm, yeah, this shouldn't be, <laughs> this doesn't have generalizability yet. Um, you know, Hey, wait a minute, let's pump the brakes here. I mean, that should say something, but it just yeah. kind of has morphed into this life of its own now. Yeah, it really has. Yeah. Some of the people who were originally involved in that research have started to distance themselves from it. And yeah, that's, that's actually a whole nother set of criticisms. And there are a lot of criticisms of it. So there are criticisms about like, how exactly should it be scored? What, what yeah. even is it measuring in the first place? Yeah. Is it really even unconscious? And if it is, is it predicting anything? And if it is, can we change it? <laughs> right. And does that do anything? Right, right. Yet, it it has become, as you said, it's taken on a life of its own. And I just don't think, I don't, I don't, I don't think scholars probably could have ever known yeah. that it would yeah. become this huge thing. But um, so Calvin uh, is a friend of mine and he studies this. He's the one I mentioned earlier who did the meta-analysis and he had mm -hmm. tweeted about, I think as the state of California was like considering giving the IET to police officers as like a potential consideration for screening for like hiring purposes. And he was like, this is such a bad idea. <laughs> and it's like, okay, if like a person who like is one of the one of the proponents of the test and still says it might have some validity in some domains is saying this is a bad idea. Why are policymakers just running? They're right. running with it because it's convenient. Like that's something yeah. that people care about right now. They want to be able to like explain um, disparities and things. And that's just a really like compelling one. And so people have just grabbed onto it and they don't even care, you know, if it's not a good measure or if it's not predicting what people think it's predicting or that you can't change it the way you want to be able to change it. Um, so yeah, I just, it, it, there are, there are other effects in social psychology that are similar to that. And Again, like the social sciences screw up all the time. It's it's difficult, sure. but it's rare to see things be screwed up for such long periods of time by so many people mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> after yeah. spending so much money. Yeah. Um, 
So I actually, like I did an analysis of this and I probably should have mentioned this because it could be totally wrong, but <laughs> I think this is right. So I Googled like, I Google scholared unconscious bias mm -hmm. and then I multiplied the number of papers, mm -hmm. the number of search results by 50 hours mm -hmm. as a conservative estimate that a paper takes 50 hours to publish. I think it's probably longer than that. If you combine up all <laughs> of the being generous. <laughs> yeah. And with that conservative estimate, I think we've humans have spent like 12,000 years studying unconscious bias. Oh my God. <laughs> 12,000 years. Now someone check my math and make sure I'm right. Don't just, don't just say I said that check it first, but I think that's right. I think it's about 12,000 years studying unconscious bias. And, and we just still, we still are just like, huh, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe it matters. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't some domains. We don't know. Like, it's just, I think it's, I think the thing, this is kind of what I was going with the test and kind of what you're saying as well in the research end of it, like there are observable things in human behavior that are terribly difficult to, to measure. You're talking about unconscious biases, like that's so difficult to measure. I'm not going to say it's the same thing as like trying to understand like consciousness, but like it's the same idea in terms of like, it's completely intrinsic or internal to somebody. How do you, like when you're developing measures or you're trying to understand things, like it's so hard to get at that. Like to get at it where you could like hang your hat on it and say, yes, this, like this is what this is. I mean, that's, that's hard to do with observable behavior. Yeah. I mean, I think of when you think of unconscious or latent, like things that are not observable, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's hard. It's super hard. It I mean, hard. we don't have the the AI yet to really help us out on the you know research methods, but maybe one day. But yeah, okay. And and, and 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 I'll just say that <laughs> that kind of goes to like the whole thing we were just talking about earlier about viewpoint diversity. Like you know maybe if there was more you know folks in in research um, and in academic circles that were like, hey guys, maybe we don't push this out quite yet. You know, maybe we need to, don't, you know, fact check this a little bit more. You know, I'm using that colloquially. You know, maybe we need to run this more. Maybe we shouldn't push this out or whatever. But when you have everyone being like, yes, yes, let's do it. This helps us explain certain disparities or whatever. There's less of like, I don't want to say gatekeepers. That sounds bad. But there's less of that kind of mechanism there. I would, um, I would even call it gatekeepers because that's... Like a lot of the time when people discuss the replication crisis or they talk about problems with social science, they, they focus on the people producing the work mm -hmm. and not the people suppressing or elevating the work. Mm -hmm. But things don't get published because a scholar decided to write an article. They right. submit it to a journal. It gets rejected. They submit it somewhere mm -hmm. else. It gets rejected somewhere else. It submits <laughs> somewhere else. It gets rejected right. there. Then they submit it somewhere else. It goes out for review. Three to four people, three to five people review it and they say it's crap and they reject it and then you say it. <laughs> but right. like this like n first of all papers they tend to be collaborative but even then you have gatekeepers to publish you got gatekeepers to get a job mm -hmm. to receive to be able to present your findings at conferences to right. win awards which helps you advance in your career to right. get tenure there are all of these points where an individual scholar's career and what they what work they can push out into the world is controlled by other scholars yeah. and they have their own biases and motivations um so yeah I, I think a big part of the replication crisis is probably that process to that piece where there are certain findings that reviewers wouldn't be as critical of because they want them to be true or findings that they would be excessively critical of because they don't want them to be true. Right. These are really difficult because it's hard to run like a tightly controlled study looking at this. Um, but there have been some studies and they find evidence that, you know, scholars who favor particular theoretical perspectives are more accepting of articles that confirm their particular theoretical perspectives. And so there's just no reason to believe that scientists are these superhumans who are somehow capable of overriding all their normal human impulses. They, they have wishes and preferences and, and goals and motivations, just like anyone else. Right. And of course it influences how they evaluate information. And when they all have similar preferences, 
that should create systematic biases um, in the field. So to me, it's a lot of people are trying to look at this, myself included. I'm trying to find better ways to test Mm -hmm. whether there's bias in the field, what that looks like. Um, But to me, it would be almost, it would be remarkable if there weren't systematic Mm -hmm. biases in the field. And in fact, everything that's happened so far has just been random mistakes made by (laughs) random people for (laughs) random reasons. (laughs) Right. Um, Yeah. And I I think it's just more of, I think like a lot of things in life is just, that's fine in some ways, but I think it's just more of like the balance of it. Um, Yeah. And, and I guess the awareness of it. Yeah. I'm, I'm pro mistake, but um, you want to be able to correct them at some point. So you would say correcting them by, you know, contributing to knowledge yourself and, you know, mm -hmm. testing other people's hypotheses. I'm not in favor of the retract everything. I don't like. approach. (laughs) Yeah. 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 No, that's, that's not, that doesn't make sense all the time. So, um, okay. So you've mentioned a few times and it was, it's on my list as well. So tell me and tell, uh, listeners what the replication bias is or, or, um, replication uh, crisis is crisis and um and why it's important yeah so the replication crisis i think was first brought to our attention in was it like 2014 maybe does that seem right right? Mm -hmm. about 2014 um and it started with i think brian nosick with the many labs projects i could be mm-hmm. wrong but i'm pretty sure that's right. that's right um and they've they've done a bunch of these since then where they they retest a bunch of findings usually they pick pretty prominent findings so papers that have been cited many many times um retest rerun those studies they try to do as close like try to copy the methods as closely as they possibly can to just replicate the study and see do they find the same findings that the original paper reported? Right. And I think the first one that came out in a, around 2014, I think it was like 40% replicated. Does that seem right to you? I believe it was around 40%. I want I know it was under 50%. Okay. So let's say under sounds, 50%. Yeah, let's say under 50. <laughs> I know that because I remember I was like, whoa. Like, yeah. Whoa, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. And this has inspired other fields to do their own replication things. And like, I think I remember seeing some with like experimental philosophy and theirs was something like 70%, which was pretty impressive. Mm, um, wow. and, and, but then I saw, oh, what was the other discipline I saw fairly recently? And it was at like 60%. I don't remember, but, but this is just a problem that's happening with these kinds of studies in general, these social science studies where you're having people, you know, read something or write something and asking their attitudes. Mm -hmm. Um, And basically, you know, scholars found things in the nineties and people have been citing those papers and assuming those findings are real, Mm -hmm. um, basing other hypotheses on those findings. And then down the line, we find out, oh, maybe that's not a real thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this has been in uh, introductory psychology textbooks for 20 years, <laughs> right. and it's not even a real thing. Did, did, um, did they do this with kind of the, I mean, you would know this, right? But the like staple um, social psych uh, experiments. Um, so I think of... Um, is it Sharif? It was a big one. Mm-hmm. Um, and Zimbardo and um, mm-hmm. who was the um, and Milligram, Milgram. Milligrams, the, Mil, or Milgrams, yeah. yeah. Did they do it with like kind of the staple? I mean, those are like huge so, social psych stuff. I don't, I don't think any of those have been replicated, but because they can't be yeah, for ethical, I mean, not the <laughs> Sharif one so much, yeah. but the Milgram. Yes. So for those who don't know, Milgram is the one with the shocking where the experimenter mm-hmm. like tells you must proceed with the study. And then the participant, <laughs> like presumably shocks the person. Actually, I think somebody did replicate the Milgram. Now that I'm saying somebody hasn't, I really actually think somebody did. It would be hard in to a different do. country, in a different country, I think uh, like Poland or something. Yeah. Um, the point of that study was, I mean, for listeners, was to try and see how people conform to, you know, obedience to authority figures, right? Mm-hmm. So you say, you know, and they would use it where they would say, what was the original one where 
you say, do you listen to authority to give a certain amount of shocks, even if you hear people like yelling and screaming? And do you do it if they're like in a warehouse as opposed mm-hmm. to like, in a, you know, if the authority figure is right next to you or if they're or in another a room? Code or is a or, Yale right, professor? Right, right. Yeah. So, so they had done, they asked a bunch of, I think, psychology professors, like, what percentage of people do you think will go all the way to the maximum level of shocks? And like something like 12 to 20% of them, I'm getting the numbers wrong, but not that many of them thought Mm -hmm. people would do it. And then a pretty um, large number did something like 50, Mm -hmm. 50 to 60%, I think of participants apparently went all the way and were willing to deliver the maximum number of shocks to people. So they're like, Oh, people are really obedient to authority. Mm -hmm the Zimbardo study, which is now called the Zimbardo experience instead of the Zimbardo experiment, (laughs) because it's not an experiment. Um, Yeah. (laughs) That's how I learned it when I was in, when I was in grad school. (laughs) Yeah. That's the one where they had the the prisoners and the prison guards Mm -hmm. um, and the prison guards apparently like turned, like turned into jerks and were like being really mean to the prisoners. And Mm -hmm. um Anyway, you can't rerun that one because yeah. you can't lock people in prison cells semi against their will. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so, yeah, so those ones, the Milgram one, I'm thinking it actually might have been replicated somewhere in a different country, but I'd forget where. Um, but yeah, you can't replicate a lot of those. And that's one challenging thing is if you do a study that's really effortful, Mm-hmm. No one's ever going to try to replicate it because it takes too much work, right? right and nobody right. wants to put that much time into a replication study. Right. So the ones that people try to replicate tend to be the pretty easy ones, mm-hmm. like a lot of the online ones. Uh, reason to do really difficult research. No one will find <laughs> out if you're p hacking. <laughs> um, but so there's uh, more yeah. recent studies that they're trying to replicate stuff from the early '90s. You know, yeah, the it's thousands. It, yeah, a lot of stuff from like the 90s and the 2000s, basically just papers that have been cited a lot. They did a lot like the priming, mm-hmm. discussed primes and money primes and religion primes. Those weren't all part of the many labs, I think, but they're finding, you know, that the priming effects don't work as well as people were making it seem like they did, which was no surprise to me as a person who wasted three years of grad school doing priming <laughs> studies. <laughs> um, but uh yeah so it, I, and i think one thing that's probably true of almost all of social science not all of it and especially not all of it in very recent years when people have been much so far as i can tell people are much better about being honest <laughs> in their right, findings right. um in general things are not as real as the literature makes them seem they're not as big as the literature make them seem because there's always going to be sort of a publication bias where um, people publish significant findings, people want their studies to have larger effect sizes, they want them to be more statistically significant. Mm -hmm. So if there's a bias in the field, the bias will be toward exaggerating things. Um, Sometimes that exaggerating thing that is exaggeration means that we think things exist that don't exist at all. And sometimes it's just that they're smaller and more insignificant than Mm -hmm. we thought they were before. Um, And so, yeah, so. And so why we can get to maybe some examples, but before that, why, um, why is that important? I mean, just for listeners sake i mean you and i and people in our field probably know like you know this is important but why who who cares right like why is is this just something for researchers to just you know nerd out about like why does this matter why is this important (laughs) well you know this is actually sort of a disagreement that bo and i have had because he says he says that um one reason so many of these like silly findings were like floating around in the, in the literature for for so long was because they didn't matter at all. Like a lot of them are things that things that maybe seem intuitively true. And so it doesn't really matter if the the laboratory study replicates, like you could think of like a priming effect, like, Oh, you're at the grocery store and you don't even realize it, but you heard a song. And then eight hours later, you're singing that song and you're like, why am I singing this song? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like that could be a priming effect. Mm -hmm you heard a song and you don't realize you hear the song and then you're singing it later. That obviously happens. Right. Um, when but... I went to the grocery store this past week and I mm-hmm. heard, 
I think it was Backstreet Boys or NSYNC or something. Backstreet like, Boys. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then like, you know, uh, you know, a couple hours later, I'm like, why, why am I, I don't even listen to that. Like, why am I saying this? Like, oh yeah. Like, I mean, there's a certain kind of like intuitive thing. Like, well, it must be that, right? Yeah. <laughs> it must be the reason. Yeah. A lot of the time I cannot pinpoint why I'm doing <laughs> what I'm doing, but I'm sure there's usually a reason. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I, I mean, I agree with that to some extent in that a lot of the time it probably doesn't really matter that much except for the consequences created for other people in the field. So you're taking grant money potentially for something that's not going to be useful. It's not going to help people solve puzzles. It's not going to solve problems. It's not going to help other scholars build hypotheses that are that are going to be confirmed um i think uh i saw i saw like um grad students doing like power posing studies um and you know just struggling to get and they're just like well this is a real effect why are my studies working what am i doing wrong um and you don't think about the grad students who fail to replicate these studies as like victims of these fake effects, but they mm -hmm. are, um, and they really, they really are because they only have X number of years to put together a CV that will get them a job. Right. And if they spend all their time, um, believing that certain manipulations are going to work a particular way or certain theories are probably right. They could, you know, basically not, be successful in grad school and not get a job and have to do something else. Right. right. So that, that always matters. Um, but other, other things matter more like the, the, uh, we already talked about the unconscious bias, but that's such a good example because so much money has been spent as the result. Mm -hmm. Now you could say that's not a big deal because the money is spent. It's making jobs, <laughs> <laughs> right. which it's, yeah, it's, it is. Um, but could that money have been spent on other things that would have been more productive? Yes, it could have been. Um, so depending on the particular findings, some findings in social science, it, it matters for other scholars because you waste their time. Right. But otherwise, it has no societal effect whatsoever. But then other things do trickle down into, they make it into the media, they make it out to the public, and they start to become parts of policies. And when those findings are wrong, it wastes a lot of people's time and a lot of people's money and it takes that time and money away from other more productive solutions or um, hypothesizing or whatever. So yeah, it, 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 the different effects vary in how much they matter, but they do matter. They all matter like to yeah. an extent. And then yes. also beyond that, you have a problem now, which is people don't trust the social sciences. And I'm like, well, they shouldn't. Why right. on earth would they? Right. right. <laughs> we had to re-earn that and we have not. Mm -hmm. So um yeah, and, and that can be bad too, because not all of social science is total crap. And now everyone thinks it is. And so the actual mm -hmm. useful stuff, people don't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. So a variety of of negative consequences. Does this and there might, and we can get into, I guess, a little bit of the specifics of this, but does this, it might just, I can assume my answer before, <laughs> to my question before I ask it, but is this more or less on uh, quantitative types of data or qualitative mm -hmm. types of data or more mixed, um, uh, mixed methods, or is it, um, you know, is it just kind of, you know, we just see it in everything or is it just more so in, you know, one or the other or something like that? Yeah, that's a good question. I pretty much actually I'm about to do my one of the, my first ever qualitative studies but I almost Good only luck. do I don't know <laughs> it's gonna be rough I'm already having problems with question design um Sucks. but mostly I think it's quantitative because that one that's what people tend to do in social psychology but um mm -hmm. I think it's kind of clear when those fail to replicate because you're talking about numbers Yeah, is the mean higher in X condition than Y condition. It was in 1992 and now it is not. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas I imagine with qualitative research, you have probably even bigger problems because things can be coded and yes. the, the researcher has even more freedom to decide yes. like, in my data file, if I see participant gave this a four, it's a four. 
Right. And I can change it, but that's outright fraud. Right. Um, and I, I assume most people don't engage in that kind of, I mean, some people do, but I, I doubt it's that common. Um, right. Whereas with qual- qualitative, you can look at a piece of information, observe something, you have notes on a particular behavior, and there are lots of ways you can interpret it. Oh, yeah. And qualitative scholars like quantitative scholars have preferences and motivations of course (laughs) care about their careers so i would bet that qualitative if i had to place money on this i would bet that qualitative research would be even less replicable Mm -hmm. but i don't know that anyone's testing it Mm -hmm. um and it would be pretty hard yeah to test it so i've mentioned this in a previous podcast so you know just as a reminder, quantitative data is usually um, dealing more with um, numbers and, and hard, you know, data sets as in qualitative is trying to look at the, you know, more subjective experiences that people have and using ethnographs and interviews and observations. And so you're, you want a mixture, I think, um, of both, not for every study, but for a lot of studies, you want to be, you want to be considerate of this is quantitatively, this is what <clears throat> Um, you know, we have hypotheses, we test, we've run the data, we have hard numbers, and there's something that you can hang your hat on that. And that's, that's a good thing, right? Because that's, you know, that's a scientific method. That's, you know, that's real science. Qualitative data is um, also important because as many people know, humans are very complicated and it's not just, you can't, it, you know, humans aren't in all facets uh, binary, right? We're not just zeros and ones, and we're just computing of like certain data sets, right? We're we one have... to nines. <laughs> <laughs> we you know, one to nine one is to nine. so hard to find. Yeah, it's so hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but in that way, you want to try and get it kind of the in betweens is how I look at qualitative data. If you're if you're mix, if you're doing a sort of a mixed study, you know, if you're just doing strictly qualitative data, then you're going going to look at um, you know semi structured interviews, and you're going to look at observations, and and you're going to when you do all of that, um, you have to still find you have to find a way to systematize the experience that you're getting at qualitatively, which makes it very difficult, but which means that there's more influence of the um, experimenters, you know, whatever they're trying to find. And so, mm-hmm. you know, anyways, that makes it difficult. And so you do need, I think, a mix of both. I don't think it for every study, but, and there are obviously issues with quantitative research as well, right? You know, it's small in sizes or, so there's not a lot of people in the study or Very artificial. Yeah. Or you're, we're using all undergrad students, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, some of the measures that People are given. People have no idea how they feel. So when you ask them, they're just making shit up. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, and it's all relying on self-report measures. And, yeah. you know, so, I mean, there's pros and cons to both. But I do think that um, in some ways within the social sciences, you know, psychology, different forms of psychology, there is a heavy lean on quantitative data. And I think importantly, that's important to do. And But you also want some qualitative aspects as well, but it's just very difficult <laughs> to, to really systematize and, and get on place. But all, all that to say, at any point, if, I, if I've read any, any study in kind of the premier journals, there's always at the end of each study, and for people that have listeners that have read this, a section at the end after the conclusions that say, you know, future directions, pros and cons, you know, weaknesses, strengths of the study, and or future directions. And so what's really nice is when I'll pick up an article, or a series of articles, and I'll say, they're saying, you know, we're basically, this was a study, and we're expanding it. Like, that makes me happy, right? Because it's like, oh, yes, like, they're trying to Mm -hmm. try, build on or replicate or, you know, and and I think that that's not what's happening. So the, my point in saying all that is that qualitative stuff is likely to be much harder to, mm-hmm. to replicate most of the time, because uh, again, like I said before, there is stronger threats to external validity for qualitative um, uh, data sets 
or, or data because it, you can't generalize it. It doesn't have generalizability. So it, because it happens with this small sample size and however that has been extracted from the population, it can't, it doesn't apply um, necessarily to big groups of people. It doesn't scale. Um, quantitatively has that issue as well, but less so, I would say, if you're comparing. Um, maybe you might think otherwise, but. Yeah, I mean, it could, but maybe not necessarily. I mean, the thing with qualitative, yeah, so the, the, the researcher has more sort of influence over how they interpret whatever the, the answer, the behavior they're observing. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, yeah, I, like what you, what you try to do with a quantitative study is replicate that study as right. exactly as possible. Now, sometimes you can get pretty darn close because you can use the exact same materials, the exact same questions and exact same order. Mm -hmm. And you can even use sometimes the same subject pool. You could do MTurk. Mm -hmm. If it was an MTurk before, do MTurk again. Um, <laughs> whereas with qualitative, I suspect it's harder or maybe even impossible to ever do an exact replication. Right. Um, because maybe you're observing people in their natural environment and no environment is the same twice, or you're interviewing people and their characteristics of the interviewer mm -hmm. or something between the interviewer and the person that's being interviewed. So, so yeah, I, that, that's, that seems tricky to me, but I would, I would suspect that quali qualitative research has just as many, if not more problems as quantitative. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Like, ideally, it's nice if qualitative and quantitative research show similar things, then you can have more confidence. And I even feel this way about like, anecdotes and observing mm -hmm. like the world and history. And like, mm -hmm. some scholars don't seem to like that, like, don't be using anecdotes to form your hypotheses. But I was like, why not? Like, mm -hmm. this is real human behavior it's like a naturalistic study and yeah we didn't have a control condition but we saw in these in this situation people did x right. i'm looking at a similar but more artificial situation mm -hmm. um now i wouldn't say like maybe you should have other reason to generate a hypothesis other than observation although maybe not um right. but yeah i think i think even even history and just observing people out in the world is actually really it's kind of it's a type of social science in a way you're trying to mm -hmm. understand what people do and then why, why mm -hmm. do they do it? Yeah. It, I guess to kind of close this a little bit in terms of the replication crisis, what maybe, I know we talked about the unconscious bias, but is there another example of maybe some of the studies you sort of talked about the priming and stuff, but is there a specific mm -hmm. example about like, Hey, here's a study that was done shit we can't get this to get the same results uh-oh uh at least this puts a question mark on maybe the definitely the reliability i guess you would say and maybe some of the validity of the study i mean but yeah there are a bunch i mean some that i've talked about in papers i've written are stereotype threat growth my so stereotype threat is the idea that um when people have like a concern over con confirming a stereotype, let's say we're going to do women in um, math. Mm -hmm. I am afraid that women aren't good at math. And I'm afraid that other people don't think women are good at math. So if I'm reminded of the fact that women aren't good at math, then when I have to perform on a math exam, that kind of like threat of that stereotype of confirming the stereotype threat actually interferes with my ability to perform on the test. Mm -hmm. Um, so there have been countless studies on this, and I don't think we know for sure whether it's a real effect or not. Um, I think probably meta-analyses would show that there's a very small, possibly trivial effect size, but again, publication bias always exists. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I would put it at 50-50, whether mm -hmm. it's a real thing or not. If it is a real thing, it's a small thing. It doesn't apply in all contexts and right. it seems to apply less in more realistic contexts. So does it have any significance at all in the real world? We don't know. Maybe not. Uh, but a lot of time has been spent on that and money. Um, <laughs> growth mindset. Similarly, the idea that people, if they have this, I this idea that, um, 
abilities aren't fixed and that you can improve um, over time. It's a lot of this is done with cognitive ability, I think. Um, but that, you know, you're not like destined to um, be at a particular level, that, that having that mindset yourself can make you perform better. But also like if your teachers have that mindset or if your parents have that mindset, then um, you might perform better. And similarly, maybe there's a very small effect there. We don't know. And if it is there, does it matter at all in the real world? I don't think we really know. A lot of time and money has been spent on that one. Um, so well, basically, when you, when you say that we don't know is that th this was shown in one or two studies, but we can't get it to show again and again and again. So that way we have question marks about whether it is or is not. Or no, it would be that they've been shown to exist many times and shown not to exist many times and sometimes okay. shown to anti-exist. <laughs> and when you average them all together, all of the attempts that you can find um, in meta-analyses, the effects are very small mm -hmm. to the point that you would wonder if they exist at all, mm. um, especially knowing that you tend to see publication bias. So... So you basically get mixed results. It shows, yep. it doesn't show, kind of shows, but then when you run a meta-analysis, for listeners that don't, don't know, a meta-analysis is where you're basically taking the, um, I guess the consummate of all of the uh, studies that have been done, and then you do something called effect sizes to try and show how much mm -hmm. effect there is within all the studies. So if you run a meta-analysis, then, and it shows, well, wait, combined together, the ones that did show, um, the ones that didn't, the ones that kind of did, when we run it all together, this doesn't tell me anything. Like it doesn't, it might not even be there. This mm -hmm. is basically kind of what you're explaining. Right. Mm -hmm. They've done, they've done ones with, I mean, they, there are lots of these kinds of meta analyses, but they did one, there was an effect that was kind of like cool for a while, which was that like disgust, being disgusted, physically disgusted makes people more like morally. Um, so they're saying that there's like, some kind of link between physical disgust and like moral disgust. And so when you're physically disgusted, you evaluate things more morally harshly. So they did this with like um, same sex marriage. Like do you evaluate mm -hmm. same sex marriage more harshly when, when you smell farts <laughs> or mm -hmm. when you're sitting at a really gross, dirty desk. Um, mm -hmm. And I have run Lord knows how many studies with like discuss primes and these <laughs> kinds of moral judgment outcomes. Mm -hmm. And my effect size for all of the studies I've ever run is probably zero, but none of those studies were included in the meta-analysis because <laughs> nobody <laughs> asked me. <laughs> so like, um, there's, there's been a, meta, a fairly small meta-analysis on those. And they found again, a very small effect size where you're like, maybe it's real, maybe it's not. But mm -hmm. that meta-analysis is missing all of the studies I did. And anytime anybody does a meta-analysis, they're missing mm -hmm. all of the studies that all of the scholars did that they never published because they right. weren't significant. So mm -hmm. whenever you mm -hmm. see a meta-analysis and the effect size is very small, that doesn't necessarily mean there's a very small effect. A lot of the time mm -hmm. it means there's nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I don't know how you use it historically, how I know it to be is, I'm a little rusty on this. Uh, anything over 0 0.3574, 0 0.4 is like moderate. Am I, am I right on this? Anything well, below that? Well, it depends which statistic we're talking about. If we're talking about like a correlation coefficient. Then I believe mm -hmm. 0.1 is small, 0.3 is medium, and 0.5 is large according to Cohen standards, which mm -hmm. are completely arbitrary. But mm -hmm. I would say people start to consider things non-existent probably at around 0.05. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, start maybe existent between 0.05 and 0.01 and maybe existent at around 0.1. I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. uh, so the point is that there's a range where you can say, yeah, okay, we can start to say, okay, this definitely doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're pretty sure of that. And then this eh, probably, and then this, you know, another range definitely does. Or we can we can make um, some good statements about its its validity and existence. Yeah, yeah. I think like you can even just visualize it. So if you so if you have an experimental condition and a control condition, and your hypothesis is experimental condition is higher than the control condition, 
then you look at 30 studies that did that, had that exact same experimental mm -hmm. control condition. If there's no effect, what you would expect to find is sometimes the experimental condition will be higher than the control condition. Not that right. often. Right. A lot of the time or most of the time, they really won't differ that much. Mm -hmm. And occasionally you'll find the reverse. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you average those all together, you see approximately nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but because publication bias is just definitely a thing, I think when the effect is actually zero, you probably expect a fairly small effect size. I don't know what you would expect, but if you're mm -hmm. getting like a 0.07 effect size, to me, that's probably a good contender for maybe not real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though, and this is what happens is you get the biased interpretation of it where people mm -hmm. who want it to be true say, hey, it's real, the effect size is 0.07. Mm -hmm. And the people who don't want it to be real are like, yeah, effect size is 0.07, and that's, that's <laughs> not very compelling evidence. Right. Um, and so even with that, you know, you're going to get biased uh, perceptions of what threshold of effect size counts yeah. as, oh, we're right, or mm -hmm. no, what a waste mm -hmm. of time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess to kind of close uh, both of these topics, they're kind of connected. Um, what can or what what can be done <laughs> how can we fix the replication crisis how can we fix more you know viewpoint diversity in the social sciences which i mean mm -hmm. all of these things i guess in a i'll just use a very like kind of layman's uh point here when i have a friend of mine that will send me an article that comes out in a journal and they say look this study showed this and my researcher brain goes on and it's like, oh boy, um, one study, that's cool. Um, okay, and then, and then I wanna look at the methods and you know, what stats they use, and, you know, all, all of these things. And then I'm like, yeah, there's some okay things in there, but it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, uh, does it scale? Has it been replicated? Has, you, know, what, you know, I have more questions, which I think is the right way to approach <laughs> articles mm -hmm. and, and data. But how do we, or what is some, your, your opinion or your thoughts about how we could potentially make it better? If By we, do you mean ideas. scholars or do you mean scholars, like yeah. people? Yeah. yeah. So with scholars, there, there are things they can do. I think the problem isn't with what can be done, but are you willing to do it? Okay. Um, so... A lot of the, I'm a, like definitely a supporter, a lot of the open science practices that people have like pre-registration, I think is important, but that doesn't stop people from file drawing their studies. Yeah. Um, I think people being forced to share their data publicly probably prevents people from mm -hmm. being willing to tinker with it because they don't want to be found out and that increases <laughs> your risk. I think all of that's really helpful. So I think participating as fully as possible in the open science movement. And nowadays as a reviewer, I generally would never accept a study if it was one study and it was not pre-registered Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I don't think I would accept it. I would say either it needs to be pre-registered or you need to replicate this yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so more transparency. And, yeah, more and, transparency. Yeah. Um, and then the <clears throat> other thing, which I personally am going, am taking on the challenge to try to turn this into a norm mm -hmm. in the social sciences. And I, I almost certainly will fail, but I'm going to try really. No, I shouldn't say that. I'm going to succeed. Okay. Um, is getting people to be willing to participate in adversarial collaboration. So this is where two scholars who disagree work mm -hmm. together, you know, set aside your ego and say, I want the answer to this question. I want to know if this is true or if that is true. Uh, the two scientists work together to design the methods. And then another, you, you give up control and another scholar conducts a study, collects the data, analyzes the data, and writes up the results. So you relinquish your researcher degrees of freedom. Now, <laughs> nobody would want to do that. But if you don't want to do that, you need to ask yourself why. And the why mm, is because yeah. you know yeah. you use your researcher degrees of freedom. And 
more and more people, I think, have come to accept that that's not the best way to pursue science. That's not the best way to pursue the truth. Mm -hmm. And the appeal I'm trying to make to people is if you're pushing up an effect that isn't real in the climate now where people are constantly trying to replicate other people's work, Mm -hmm. you will be found out eventually. Yeah. Yeah. If you publish studies and you've been secretly file drawing half of the studies and only publishing the ones that confirm your hypothesis, Mm -hmm. you might get a few good pubs and that will help your CV. Maybe it'll even get you a job. But eventually, people will know your effect is fake. Mm -hmm. If you do this multiple times, they'll know multiple of your effects are fake, and they will find out that you're a fraud. They will. And so better you find out that you're wrong (laughs) than someone else find out that you're wrong. Right. I mean, this has happened. I mean, this has happened a handful of times. I mean, it happens. It's happened tons of times (laughs) now with these many labs projects. And it's like, I think deep down, Especially when people are, for example, if you know in your head that you filed or a study, that means you don't have as much confidence in your effect as you have portrayed publicly, which means you could be wrong. And why would you leave that to other people to discover when you have the opportunity to discover yourself? So Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to convince people that this is actually beneficial to their own careers to participate in adversarial collaborations that will almost eliminate people's research degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think when outsiders observe these adversarial collaborations, they should be more persuaded by the findings of those because they'll know, well, this scholar who is proponent of X helped Mm -hmm. design the study, chose Mm -hmm. the methods, chose the results, and it didn't find X. Nah, maybe X is wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Right. right. Um, (laughs) And so that's what I really would like to see. And I, I want that. I want that to be a norm and I want that to be something where if people refuse to participate in adversarial collaborations, then that's a sign of a lack of confidence in the same way, not pre-registering your studies Mm -hmm. would suggest, like if you had the hypothesis beforehand, why wouldn't you pre-register your study when you know that it makes your study a little little bit better, uh, it's going to get in a better journal. There's no reason not to. Um, so you and want to so, see you want to see people fight. That's it. <laughs> yes. You want to see I actually academics like an idea throw down. to make these like wrestling style challenges where they're like <laughs> Roy Baumeister challenges. <laughs> so and so. <laughs> uh to whatever. Yeah. And then like and then people like can bet money on no. <laughs> it would be fun. I um, think and I think the the idea is I mean if I I think it, yeah, it's super difficult, but I, I greatly uh, admire and respect the, uh, <laughs> the pragmatism. I mean, I think it's just such a pragmatic way of saying like, Hey, we can, you know, bitch and complain about all this stuff or we can do something about it. And, mm-hmm. you know, here is an idea of how to do that. And, you know, you hope it works or, or maybe it can be, you know, built upon. So I think that's, encouraging to hear so yeah i will you know wish you wish me luck <laughs> wish you luck on that one <laughs> if i'm not already the most hated woman in social psychology i will be in like two years <laughs> everybody work with your enemies <laughs> it's great though I, I i like it it's a novel way of looking yeah. at it I, I like it i suspect it, it for some people it just isn't possible or it's, they just wouldn't be able to do it but i think some people would and um, yeah yeah want to find those people Okay, so let's shift gears and we can we can end on this one. Um, <clears throat> the big topic, but let's let's put a dent in it, I guess. <laughs> um, it would be I, I would be a fool to get you on here and not talk about free will. I mean, <laughs> I mean, just you know, for those of you who don't know, you know, Corey's done some awesome work on this stuff. So um maybe just like you know quick snapshot of what got you interested in that. I mean, it's an interesting discussion. I'll tell you a little bit of my, some background on that as well. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, and then we can kind of get into some of the terms and stuff. So what, what was the interest? What, why did you consider that? or want to tackle that very big issue. <laughs> yeah. So I think, so I was using 
it was for a stats class I was taking in grad school. Um, we needed to bring our own data set to do some analyses. And I actually honestly have no idea why I chose to do a free will belief measure, but I did. <laughs> um, and then some things like political attitudes and desire for vengeance and retribution and stuff. And um, I had found that free will belief was like correlated with desires to punish and for vengeance. And that all made a lot of sense. And some people had even published basically that same idea before, but I was working with um, Pete and one of his big things is like this idea of motivated reasoning. So people believe what they want to believe, or they evaluate information in ways that allows them to justify their, their own, um, their own behavior, but their own beliefs about the world and all that. So I was like, well, I wonder if part of the reason people believe in free will isn't, it's not just that people believe in free will and therefore they want to punish. Maybe they want to punish and therefore they believe in free will. Mm. And then it turns out Nietzsche had this idea. And I actually don't even know if I got it from him or not. Like in my mind, it cap it like came to me. And then I was like, oh yeah, Nietzsche had it was, this idea. It was, it was your unconscious uh, bias towards him. Yeah, it might have been. And I <laughs> might have been like remembering my philosophy classes from undergrad. Um, but yeah, do you tell uh, Nietzsche's idea? <laughs> or briefly? Yeah, so Nietzsche has this quote where he's like, we know only too well what free will really is, the foulest of all theologians artifices aimed at making mankind responsible in their sense. Mm -hmm. Wherever responsibilities are sought, it is usually the instinct of wanting to judge and punish, which is at work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, basically the idea that free will believe is sort of constructed as a justification for believing that humans are morally responsible so that we can punish them. Yeah. Um, so by this point, I've run, by now in my career, um, I've run, Lord, like 20 possibly plus studies, hmm. probably more than that, um, <laughs> where I basically make people want to punish by reading about immoral behavior. The coolest one I ever did was with my um, social psychology students in grad school. We, Pete, emailed the class and... Um, for some of the class, he emailed them and said that a student in the class on the last exam had cheated, that we found a cheat sheet. Mm -hmm. um, so they were being led to believe that one of their classmates had cheated and we were going to have a discussion about this. And then in the other, I think there were actually three conditions, but these are the two that ended up mattering. Um, the other condition, we it was like a control condition. And we were just like, we're going to do a an activity in the next class. And then we asked them to complete like an attached survey and the survey included a measure of free will belief. And we found that the people who thought that one of their classmates had cheated on the exam reported stronger belief in free will. And so we see this as supporting Nietzsche's hypothesis that potentially part of the reason we view humans as these sort of special uniquely moral creatures unlike any other animal um is because we have to well we don't have to necessarily but it, it's it's beneficial if we morally judge one another and we punish one another because that keeps other people's behavior in check mm -hmm. humans are social creatures so they care a lot about their moral reputations being judged morally or fear of being judged morally stops people from doing a lot of harmful things. Right. Um, so, and I, I, I don't know, there was one point where I thought maybe we like evolved these beliefs in free will, but now, in fact, it's, through conversations with Bo, where he's convinced me that's probably wrong. <laughs> but um, <laughs> now I'm like, well, maybe it's not so much that we evolved the belief in free will, but rather in societies where we feel the need to constantly justify our behavior and particularly harmful behavior, mm -hmm. um, we would feel the need to justify that with the concepts of moral responsibility and free will. So, you know, we lock people up for life sometimes sometimes we put people to death mm -hmm. um because we think what they did was so bad and if we really truly were to see them as animals like we do any other animal that has like certain instincts and it has like 
a, it has particular genes and it had a particular environment. Maybe it grew up in a particularly bad environment and that could have influenced the kind of person they grew up into and they had no control over that. They didn't choose their parents. They didn't choose their genes. Mm -hmm. They didn't choose where they went to school, blah, blah, blah. If we really accepted all of that, you almost could have like crippling empathy for people <laughs> yeah. and then be a po and they're actually philosophers who, who have this idea now, like the, the whole idea of punishment is unjustifiable and therefore we should not do it. And mm -hmm. we could not do it, but we also know that punishment works. Mm -hmm. Um, putting people in jail keeps criminals off the streets at least for a little while and probably prevents victimization. Um, so it's a complicated problem. Um, but both are, both are occurring out of, based on Nietzsche's point and then some of the, the social psych research is that they're both occurring because we're social animals. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were foxes, right? Mm -hmm. And we're solitary, maybe that we wouldn't need that. Right, that they're they're, they're they're two they're two different mechanisms for trying to manage, you know, us as human primates cohabiting the planet together in, in some way. Right, you had the free will aspect, and then mm -hmm. linked with that is the punishment aspect. And so, the, because of the because we're social mammals, that that would be the case. And maybe you, I don't know if you've done research on this but you know does that expand outward to other primates or other social animals mm -hmm. you know that would be interesting right but yeah i have this idea that i <laughs> i've presented this at conferences so many times always trying to get someone else to do this study and <laughs> i might actually do it now myself but the study idea is that people would anthropomorphize machines more mm. when they want to blame them and punish them so like i have these images of like people punching vending machines when it doesn't give them their candy bar and like me calling my laptop an asshole when it's frozen. <laughs> like people, like if you Google people beating up ATM machines, there are a lot, a lot of people have beat up. And I'm like, okay, it's interesting. I've definitely been frustrated and like angry at my laptop and it's hard to like view it that way, but really it resembles feelings of anger toward mm -hmm. my laptop but mm -hmm. i've never been like i've never like praised it i've never been like oh good laptop you're doing your job you know <laughs> like right. it it's like it seems to me that i attribute more agency to my laptop when it screws me over and i was like okay mm -hmm. do people do this with atm do they do they think an atm is an asshole when it doesn't give them the money they were supposed to get but mm -hmm. they don't think it's an angel when it gives them double the money they were supposed mm -hmm. to get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or right. when the vending machine gives you two candy bars and you only paid mm -hmm. for one. Um, so maybe I'll do the study. But I think yeah. it's I think it's probably true. So like if you look at um cases where animals uh cause great harm, I think probably people do have a tendency to anthropomorphize them a little bit more and think like animals are can often be portrayed as like kind of evil but mm -hmm. not necessarily morally virtuous oh is that true maybe that's wrong like dogs are seen maybe as morally virtuous aren't they yeah but there's the whole artificial selection thing there right and they yeah, were kind of yeah, yeah. you know literally you know dogs are weird <laughs> yeah they are they're selected for humans like they don't really function or work without human i mean they can but they just I mean, that's just their evolution at this point. Yeah. So maybe dogs. Ben Weingard different. would say that capybaras are morally <laughs> virtuous. <laughs> well, the people say it's about like orcas, right? You know, because you yeah. see orcas like, I mean, legitimately, you know, you know, killing other animals in the ocean and then will, uh, I think seals, right? And then, mm -hmm. I mean, this video of it, of them like enjoying torturing them. Yeah before finally killing i mean it's just really it's like you you only really see that in humans i mean i don't know if maybe other animals do that too but some there is hypothesized that maybe they're getting pleasure out of you know because there's no function yeah. right? there's <laughs> no utility for it like you, know, you have these you know and orcas are highly social uh animals and so it's just like hmm you know maybe there's something to that so um, it's because they don't have moral judgment and they don't believe in free will. And so they just let the evil sadistic members of their group 
hang out and they're like whatever yeah yeah, yeah. no it's it's it is very I've seen some of those that footage and it's a very disturbing thing to think about it's like whoa like you expect it from humans but which is interesting. Oh, right? animals do some messed up stuff. They do I some mean, horrible things, like but you don't analyses of like cats them. and like cats apparently needlessly torture like millions of animals, mice and birds and, and we're mean, like the, oh, kitty. The, the the deaths of the birds, I mean, is in, in North America is predominantly. I mean, I, there was that uh, article that came out a couple months ago that showed that, you know, house cats are like legitimately killing off North American birds. I mean, just in yeah, thousands. Good. It's crazy. Okay, so maybe just uh, real quick, what, how would you define, I guess, free will? And what does that look like? I guess Ugh. that's a hard. Yeah. One, but... Yeah. So I have this like desire to define it in the way that I think is the only way that would ever have been interesting, um, mm -hmm. which is the, the libertarian definition. So the ability to do otherwise, um, given the exact same history of events leading up to the moment of the decision, if we want to call it a decision. So could a person being who they are, having the genes they have, their upbringing they have, everything leading up to that moment, everything in the history of the universe leading up to that moment, mm -hmm. if it were exactly the same series of events, could they have done something differently? Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that I sort of favor that definition is because I think surely that's what people have been puzzling over for so long um, because we didn't always have such a sophisticated understanding of humans. For example, we didn't really, we still don't really fully understand how genes interact with environments to create human behavior. We certainly didn't understand it a hundred, five hundred, a thousand years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so I assume that had to be what people were puzzling over. Is there a sort of self-made self that determines what a person does in a given moment that they choose independent of their biological and physical reality? Mm -hmm. um, now, a lot of philosophers have redefined the concept in a way that I think makes it completely uninteresting. So like the compatibilist definition is, mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think something like doing what you want to do as like a rational, regular human being. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if that's what we've been meaning, then we wouldn't have been debating it all this time. Right. right. <laughs> because yeah, people can do what they want to do. Like, and there's an average human kind of thing we get when some people like we get when people have like severe mental illnesses for example mm -hmm. um and we would say that's not average um so i i'm like surely that's not what we've been discussing if that's the definition then let's stop talking about it right now because it's no yeah. longer interesting <laughs> yeah. right. so so i define it like the libertarian way and then but then the thing there it's like well if you define it that way it can't exist and so mm -hmm. then we should stop talking about it still. <laughs> so, right. So, so basically if, if I have here, right. My, you know, my bottle of water, right. Mm -hmm. I'm choosing to pick it up, right. That's, this is what people would say. Now, I made the choice to pick it up. In fact, I, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> right. I wouldn't either. I wouldn't either <laughs> because you have to kind of assume that there's, um, internally for us, a there, there, right? That there's mm -hmm. a type of, you know, there's an I, there's an ego, that there's someone in the driver's seat within us that's pulling the strings here and telling you to do all these things. But in reality, as far as we know, that doesn't exist. And it's, you know, at the end of the day, I, I had, before I, I did that, I had, I didn't choose to do that. There was a, an instinct, an impulse that the example of me holding up the water bottle felt like a good example to do. I could have very easily <laughs> done the, you know, my other cup that's in here or my pen that's right here. I had no idea. I didn't, it, it's completely involuntary almost. And so it, and people, I wonder, I always wonder the whole free will deterministic argument, if it's more of just a, which I find these arguments boring as well. Is it just a semantic thing? 
mm-hmm. right? You're saying one thing and meaning something else, right? Are you saying that I have free will? Okay, if that helps you sleep at night, cool. <laughs> but in reality, you don't, right? Now, that doesn't mean that there's some external agent, i.e. a supreme being, God, that has it all mapped out. Sure, maybe if you want to play in that world. But it just means that they, we have certain instincts and certain aspects as um, you know, social primates that you know, we do these things. So in that way, I would agree, right? Like I don't, I also don't believe in free will because I just don't think that there's any actuary or any type of evidence to prove that, right? So the common example gets into the legal argument, right? Which is if I go and I premeditate murder, right? I go and I kill, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go, I'm going to kill this person with this weapon on this day at this time, blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, <clears throat> you know, how, how, how do you explain that, Corey? Like, how does that happen, right? That's obviously a choice, right? Someone's choosing to go and commit an act, you know, very detailed. How do you say that? That's free will. How would you say that that's not free will? That's not deterministic. How would you explain that? I mean, whenever the original thought, so, so the way that I try to, so, okay, so part of your question was like, is this a semantic issue? And I think for a lot of people it is, but I think for a lot of people it isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and even like very, very smart people I know, colleagues of mine, for them, they really genuinely, literally, scientists believe in the idea that people could do otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, but to me, the, the way that it doesn't make sense is that anytime something happens, it has to have been caused by something before it, mm-hmm. or it has to have been not caused by anything before it. Right. Um, and if it's been caused by something, so those are the two options, either it's caused or it's not caused. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's caused by something before it, then it's caused by something before it, literally, um, right. in a series of events. So something that has already happened and everything in a person's life, there's always something that happened before it. And mm-hmm eventually you get to the point where it's before the person was ever born. Yeah. So you can trace the causal history of a person's life back to before they were born. And surely we say they're not responsible for their genes. They're not responsible for being born. They're not responsible for where they were born. And, you know, if they sneezed because there was a tickle in their nose when they were a baby and whatever. So there's a causal history there. So either something caused a person to do something and that causal history traces back and people don't have control over the initial conditions of their causal trajectory or a particular behavior could be not caused by something that happened before it in which case it would just be completely random Mm -hmm. and free will wouldn't make any sense if it was just random (laughs) then you're just flipping a coin so it's like you're not responsible if something in the world prior to that caused you to do something and you're not responsible if it's random. So I just don't even understand how you could be responsible in like the fullest sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Now that isn't to say like we can't distinguish between like levels of responsibility in some sense, only because it's useful Mm-hmm. for shaping human behavior like mm-hmm. now the premeditation one is kind of weird because you do get punished more harshly for a premeditated um murder <sighs> does that make sense because they should be aware that they're going to be punished and that didn't deter them so they must have been even more motivated i don't i mean uh, the the philosophy behind why a premeditated murder should be punished more than a you know a murder of passion i don't know <laughs> if that should be a thing or not but i think it always seems to be more in terms of degrees right it's more of sure we can well i think uh, a legal system is probably under the assumption that people have autonomy and free will right i mean that's probably implicit in that yeah um, they're trying to change that or not they're they are not trying to change that but some people are like mm-hmm. lawyers will be invoking they're already invoking like uh, like neural explanations and genetic explanations and i assume as we become more sophisticated you're going to see more and more of that oh they had this 
set of genes that's associated with criminal behavior. They didn't choose their genes. Right. And it's like, what are we going to do with that? I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> I don't know. Because yeah, they did not choose their genes. Right. Uh, and that does increase their odds of committing uh, a crime. But if we just say no one is responsible, then, mm -hmm. then what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. What well, do we do? <laughs> I think I think that it's also the terms of of like in terms of the free will piece, even with like my premeditated murder example of yeah, but you still have to get the thought to rise to consciousness. And no one authored that thought to get there. It happens. It's just, you know, I don't know the next sentence I'm gonna say. I don't know what I'm gonna say five seconds from now. You know, I don't know that and I'm I'm finding out as I'm doing it. And, and I think it's the same thing if you trace it all the way down is like, mm, yeah, maybe this person uh, did something or they have some kind of um, reason to premeditate some type of murder. But the idea of murder has to come into your brain at some mm -hmm. point. And you're not saying, I want to have this thought. It arises. Yeah. Um, yep. As a kind of a sequitur here is it that thinks you <laughs> yeah yes this is this is the power of uh crime and punishment mm -hmm. um i don't know if you've read crime and punishment it's a mm -hmm. famous piece of literature by russian author dostoevsky and you know the first um you know first part of the book i mean there's literally like you know a couple of scenes in there where you know the main character is saying Oh, but how could I, how could I think to kill the old, the old hag, the old woman is how that's just translated, you know, how could I, how could I think such a thought? No, it's all terrible. I mean, he's legitimately surprised by the thought and he's saying, well, well, I, I couldn't do it. And then before you know it, he's orchestrated this whole premeditated murder. And in fact, he commits a double homicide. Spoiler alert for people that haven't read it for the past 160 years. <laughs> it's like the first chapter. <laughs> it's like the first part. Yeah, it's the first 80 pages. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's, but I, that's a really insightful way of saying, yeah, even people that commit the most heinous crimes, you can't make an argument that they chose to do it as a matter of first principles and how you're understanding free will and determinism. So the next conversation, because I think there are two different conversations, but the next one, which is what you're getting at is, okay, we don't have free will. So does that mean we don't have responsibility over our actions? How could that be? Mm -hmm. And you would say, yes, we don't have responsibility. <laughs> well, I have like very complicated feelings about it because I would say like, in some sense, no, we were not responsible. Um, and... I think like I have sort of intuitions. Like I, 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 I'm one of these people that I think is like sometimes crippled by excessive empathy for people because I really do view people as like sort of victims of who they are. I'm like you can't control your personality. I I have like some negative personality traits and I know they suck, but I can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. um, but so in some sense, no. But I I don't. So there's um a scholar, Greg Caruso, he's a philosopher, mm -hmm, he's a mm -hmm, friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And he's like very opposed to the idea of retributive punishment. And then, okay, we can, how do you define retributive punishment versus other kinds of punishment? Um, but like, so I think certain kinds of punishment are probably necessary for a functioning society. Like prisons, you probably do need some people to be taken off of the streets because they literally will just keep committing crimes. Mm -hmm. And we have to think about, sure, the criminal, and it's not their fault, but we have to think about the potential victims, um, the actual victims and the potential victims. We want to save mm -hmm. other people, other innocent people's lives, and we care about them. Yeah, it's risk. So we risk, need, uh, we have to be responsible risk. and, uh, we want to keep society safe. Um, so let's do what we can do there. But then so many things fall outside the realm of like criminal behaviors that we would want to discourage. And that's where I think moral blame is mm -hmm. useful. Um, so like there, there are lots of things. I'm oh, sorry. My dog just broke into my house. <laughs> there are a lot of things that, um, that, humans want to do that aren't necessarily illegal but we would say they're immoral or unethical or they're not productive sure. for society and we sure. want to discourage those behaviors and we do that through 
through social judgment and and blame and being and making people worry that we're gonna think they're a bad guy, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so if we were to get rid of that, I think. And and this that's t- assumes we could, and I don't think we could. So s- some of these these conversations are like almost pointless because it's like, good luck, uh, Greg Caruso. <laughs> like, yeah, even yeah. if people one hundred percent buy into like yeah. the like the the philosophy of your argument, and they're like, yes, you're right. Mm-hmm. How could we ever override our impulses to get angry and to judge and to blame people? Right. I just don't know that you could. Um, but whatever. To be, to be just a small plug, I believe he has a book coming out on this. Yeah, uh, he always has a book coming out. I feel like he has a book coming out like every three months. He has to be like one of the most productive people. Yeah, ever. I'm curious no to read it. it. I'm curious to read it. Yeah, um, he's, yeah, he's an interesting guy. But I, but I, I think it's yeah, it's a very hard, a hard thing to kind of say. I, the way that I think about it is, we have to act under the illusion of free will. I think as a as a society in which we have. Um, our instincts can deceive us and they can be terrible. Again, it goes back to my crime and punishment example. You know, the beauty of that book shows that humans can do the worst possible things to each other and the best possible things mm-hmm. to each other. And each person is capable of any one of those potential ways of doing. Do you being. think anybody is capable of, I don't know if that's true. In terms of both ways, the worst and, and best things. You think all people are capable of both the worst and best things? Okay, maybe not all. Maybe not all. <laughs> and if you're if you're starting to weed maybe, out, maybe maybe no maybe. And actually, to I tried to do this like thought experiment. Like, if you take modern men, if you were have... to say people that have developmental disabilities or mm-hmm. certain mental health conditions, or they actually probably have limited capacity to mm-hmm. to do some of this. So that's fair. I would say. No, but I mean, even like normal, normal functioning. People. Like, do you adults? think there are normal people who literally just like would never kill someone no matter what? That's just not who they are. No. You don't I don't think, think anyone like that exists. I think everybody has the potential or could have the potential to do that. Maybe. I'll give you an example. Yeah. If, I, oh, you're, you know what? You're probably right. Probably like if you're like if somebody were attacking you, you probably could easily kill them. Yeah. I mean, it would be Listen, silly if you could no, then nobody would, would want to be no one wants to be in my head for <laughs> five minutes but i will run these thought experiments in my head and i'll say mm-hmm. hmm, what would i do if this or this or mm-hmm. this and like you can easily sit there and say oh yeah i would do that but then it's like when you're in that moment and you can take other experiences that you have in your life you're like whoa i was totally surprised by myself I would never think I would have done this or this. Mm-hmm. And you put enough of the right variables in place in a certain environment and all these other, you know, certain predispositions. And yeah, I can very quickly, like, I don't, I don't think I would ever, you know, kill anybody. Yeah. But, but you put my, my life at risk. You put, you know, you know, if, if someone's coming at my daughter or something, it'd be like, yeah, I wouldn't even think twice. Or even like, if you, if you li- if you were living in a different time period where you were living in a small group of people and you had mm-hmm. like enemies that you were like fighting for territory and stuff right then and also you didn't have the same like moral norms that we have in modern That's societies right. where we like we don't kill each other right we're all on board with that one <laughs> like yeah i mean probably almost all men would be pretty and a lot of women too mm-hmm. men more so because they probably would have had that responsibility yeah. more throughout history but yeah, and, and, and different makeup and all the rest. I think that, mm-hmm. so that's on the negative, but I also think that... Um, it's good to be able to admit that to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I think it, it would need happen. to. There is yeah. a set of circumstances where that could happen, yeah. It's one of those things where it's like, there is probably a, there is probably a list of things that I probably, on my own volition, right, if I'm not like drugged or something, that I would never do some things. There's definitely a list <laughs> mm-hmm. of things I would never do. And then so I think it's think. also, that's what I think, right? Yeah. Um, which is, you know, terrifying when you think about it. But yeah. then there's the other other side of it, right? Of like, what is the most, you know, we could, you know, split hairs about, you know, altruism and all that. But, you know, the most altruistic act, could I have the potential to do that? What is that sacrificing your life to save another person? That's one of them. Um, you know, could I um, sacrifice is a big one. Um, could I, you know, 
do something where I'm giving uh, all of my worldly possessions to other people in need, uh, mm-hmm. which again, you could say that's a type of sacrifice. But, you know, if you're thinking of the most, you know, um, altruistic kinds of deeds or actions, you know, could, do I have the potential to do that? And some people would argue, no, by human nature is fucked, right? Like we just, <laughs> we don't want to do that. No. And Most I think that- don't. I mean, has, has almost like how many people throughout the history of the world have ever done that, given up everything they have to, I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of, you know, isn't there certain nuns and monks and spiritual leaders and, you know, a lot of time they're taken care of, they get like a house and they get what they need, you (laughs) know, like, well, this is, that's my, I don't think there's a pure altruism personally. Yeah. Um, but Right. I mean, but you could even make an argument, granite, granite, you know, could make the same thing, but like, you know, Bill Gates has given mm-hmm. literally billions of dollars, billions of his money that he earned, right? Mm-hmm. To so many things for humans on the planet. But isn't for him not to like, I think Bill Gates has done so many amazing things and like the world is better off for having Bill Gates by a sure. long shot. Sure. But in his case, is that almost like just not hoarding because he probably still gets every single thing he wants plus right. some. Right, right. <laughs> and all of his family members and friends get every single thing they want plus some. And then he's right. like, I still got all this extra crap. What am I going to do right. with it? So, and so I this know, is- I'll get props for giving in a lot of it away. <laughs> so this <laughs> not is- Not that that went through his mind. This is, well, I mean, who knows, right? But I think it probably, if I had to make an assumption, it would be like, I have- I have uh, what do they call it? They call it a uh, what do they call it? Not stupid money. What do they call it? They call it um. There's a word for it, but he's just money where he just doesn't. It doesn't even. It's just numbers on a screen at this point, right? Like he just doesn't yeah. even like you know. But you know that's kind of that was kind of Nietzsche's point about morals, right? Was when you're asking is something you know good or bad, you're not really asking about is it good or bad. What you're always asking is the intention. Right. Because mm-hmm. you immediately go to and say, yeah, but what Bill Gates have done that if da, 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 you're you're inquiring about his intentions, which is fair. Yeah. But and I think that that's the point is that does it does it matter at the end of the day? Right. If people <sighs> yeah. are re, are the recipients of a good deed, does it really matter what the in the valuation of it is or what the intention of it is of the of the the person doing it? Yeah, I think in one way, maybe in another way, probably not. I have like an intuition that it does matter, but um, in practical ways, it, it often doesn't. And right. so, so often, in fact, most of the time, people either genuinely believe they're doing the right thing or they're able to justify to themselves why they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And therefore we have to look at human history and all of the horrible things that people have done to other people and accept that almost all of those people thought they were doing the right thing. And then you're like, Mm -hmm. well, maybe intentions don't matter, but Mm -hmm. I, I, it's hard. It's almost impossible for me to escape the feeling that the intention does matter because you're like, oh, you you literally want people to suffer versus <laughs> you caused a lot of people to suffer, but you really <laughs> thought you were helping right. people. Right. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, that's a complicated. It's it's complicated. And I think it just goes back to I just think humans are complicated and tremendously complicated, not because they're trying to be, or I think it just in terms of a, a living organism at at bottom is there's just a lot of complications that are there. And, you know, I think you can make a, I mean, this is why I have, I have a, a certain perspective on, or worldview and philosophy on humans is we're really complicated. And I think that we're, we're messy. And so it's why I don't really like absolutes because it's like, yeah, people can make horrible mistakes and do horrible things did they mean to do it? Did they choose to do it? I don't think so. And even if they do, even if they did, even if that was the case, I would still say that there has to be some type of redemptive quality because those very people can make and create the complete opposite 
Mm -hmm. right? I mean, take anybody, any example of like, you know, Kevin Spacey is a phenomenal actor and has contributed to the arts, like legitimately. Like he mm -hmm. wasn't, he like the, he was running like one of the Shakespeare theaters in England and like he was th that company and he's an incredible performer and all the rest. And he did some not so good things. Mm -hmm. Um, but it doesn't mean that we have one one thing or a series of actions define a complete, entire, complex, messy in human individual. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for everybody. Mm -hmm. That's true for you. That's true for me. That's true for um, all people that we see in you know politicians and um, you know people in Hollywood and 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 everyone else. And so again, it goes back to my central thesis that we have potential. M most I'll, I'll, I'll alter it. <laughs> most people have the potential to do the worst things or the best things. And they could very well do both. And all that says is, yeah, people are complicated, but then what you decide to, you know, what are your moral attributions that you're making about that? I don't think are very helpful at the end of the day. If, you know, because there, there's a distance between here's your intention, but then here's the actuality of it. And I don't think they always have to align. And I don't think they mm -hmm. always have to align to where they're beneficial for some other people. It's like, in another way, everybody uses everybody, but I think mm -hmm. you can use people in an exploitive way and a non-exploitive way. But mm -hmm. I, I, I think that distinction is important because it's saying you're recognizing it's going to happen, but then I think kind of uh, parsing it out says, well, how do you understand the the kind of nuance and differences with it but mm -hmm. i don't know maybe you see it otherwise <laughs> yeah no in like the case of like kevin spacey or like other let's say powerful people i think it's just so impossible for us to know what horrible things we would be capable of if we had the same amount of power and influence and right. um right. sway over people i guess um so yeah, he, he that's not to excuse anything he did. Um, of course. And right. a lot of people wouldn't do what he did. Mm -hmm. And and I mean I disagree with you a little bit in the sense that I don't know like I think I think people are different, you know, like mm -hmm. humans exist on many 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 spectrums. Yeah. Um and the thresholds are different for different people like some people they might in modern society with the norms we have there might be l almost nothing that would make them kill another person except for say someone was going to kill their kids or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that would do it. <laughs> and then there are other people where, you know, they get into a spat at the bar and then they'll kill someone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so right. people right. have different, um, people are more or less risky, I guess, for mm. causing harm and for, for, um, for altruistic actions as well. Some people will just do that on their own. Other people would only do it if they're going to get recognition. Other people would do it for, you know, whatever reason. So, so people are different in that way. Um, but again, they don't choose their personality and then, right. Um, and then, yeah, intentions often misalign with how broader society would evaluate the outcomes of those behaviors like I think about this even with with scientists and like the the replication crisis thing a lot of scholars have wasted a lot of people's time and money I don't think any of them meant to I don't think any of them mm -hmm. meant to harm anybody I think they probably wanted to publish and help their own careers mm -hmm. and maybe that's like a little bit selfish but not in any abnormal way right. like a perfectly normal anyone yeah. might do it sort of way right. um but you do want to stigmatize that behavior a little bit to disincentivize it so that other people don't have to suffer as a consequence. But you're um, saying that people are different, which I would agree, but you're saying that because we have different norms now as 500 years ago, let's say, and you don't have to go mm -hmm. back that far, but that that's the difference because people are always, always mm -hmm. have been different, right? No, no, no. Yeah. No, I'm not saying the only difference is like, there are modern norms. I'm saying even right now, 
mm-hmm. people are different and back then people were different and mm-hmm. time is different. <laughs> so yeah, it's like, sure, that's why sure. it's difficult to compare like the morality sure. of people from 500 years ago, because right. we don't know what an average behavior would look like 500 years ago. And I think we would want to say, well, we shouldn't judge an average behavior that mm. harshly. Mm. Or maybe yeah. we should, I don't know. But. No, I, I think that's right. Because that's what people do when they try and make um, revisionist history, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, well, let's use the norms of 2020 for mm-hmm. norms in 1720. It's right. like, well, people on one way have always been the same. And the fact that there's variance, but what isn't the same it's yep. time and culture <laughs> and and where we're at and you know the fact that you know we have iPhones and you know mm-hmm. not just a printing press i mean that's a big difference right so there's, yeah. there's there's a lots of added variables to consider so yeah. that's fair people yeah. make that argument like that like is there anything we do now that will be judged so harshly in the future and i've heard people say that it will be like how we treat animals like factory farming i'm actually not sure that will ever mm-hmm. be true i don't know if if people will ever get off the meat, <laughs> but it is like, it's a reasonable contender. Like people literally created a demand for a certain degree of animal suffering. And right now it's so normal that right. a lot of people judge it, but a lot of people don't. Right. Um, and so you could imagine if it were the case that like 200 years from now, everybody, nobody ate bacon um, if it came from an actual pig mm-hmm. and anyone who was alive today, they were like, you're out of here. <laughs> you were eating BLTs and bacon cheeseburgers. <laughs> that, that probably won't happen, but you never know. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, I think it's, I mean, obviously no one knows the future. And I think it's just hard to know that, like, I don't know. That's the kind of cultural evolution argument, right? Um, I think Heinrich makes this argument recently and he's, you know, other mm-hmm. people have made this argument that like people are the same, yeah, um, but not yeah. like they are. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that we're the same species and there's enough to say sameness over, yeah. you know, 50,000 years, whatever, or 200,000 years, it whatever it is. It takes time for humankind to change. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah, that's a nice way to put it. Yeah. But yeah. obviously in different, even generations or decades, there's going to be whatever the norms are, are going to impact how we are different in some way. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. but humankind, I like that. That's a nice way. Of it. <laughs> okay. Well, we covered everything. Yay! <laughs> um, We've yeah, solved this all is, the problems. This, yeah, we solved all the problems. Um, you're going to get, you're going to get academics to fight each other. Um, Yay. That's my goal. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a lot of fun. Um, I, yeah, I'm super grateful, really appreciative for you coming and talking about super important things. And I hope uh, people find it just as uh, exciting as, as we did. Yes, <laughs> um, thank you. Tell people where they can find you and I, you can uh, maybe make a plug for a few things. So uh, <laughs> yeah, where, where can they find you online and, and your stuff and, and, and everything? Yeah, so... I have a website, CoreyJClark.com, or I'm on Twitter at I'm Hard Corey. It's a play on I'm Hardcore. <laughs> Nobody gets it. <laughs> um, and the only plug that I really want to put is if you're a scholar and you're interested in the idea of adversarial collaborations, you want to participate in one, or you think it's a good idea, you just want to like tell me it's a good idea. Um, then then do that because um i'm i'm going to be trying to make this a thing um and make it a norm if i can yeah. over the next few years <laughs> no that's great no there's 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 a lot of hard work to do so yeah look uh i had a lot of fun this was great i really greatly appreciate you uh talking for you know over two hours and <laughs> um and you're always more than welcome to come and try ideas or you know just talk about whatever's on your mind so um hopefully we can have you come here again sometime in the future so thank you very much for having me it was it was a lot of fun yeah i greatly enjoyed it so okay keep uh doing what you're doing all all your really (laughs) important work i really i really mean that and um make some small differences over over time so i uh i'll be (laughs) well-intended all righty i appreciate it (laughs) thanks
Bye. Bye-bye.